Welcome to this service of First United Methodist Church of Roseburg. I'm so glad that you're here today as we gather to remember who we are through the sacrament of baptism. Now, I would encourage you to make sure you've got some water um, as a way of remembering our baptism, remembering the vows that we made or that were made in our name, the vows that we affirmed and reaffirmed at confirmation at joining the church. So remind ourselves of what we say in different ways every Sunday when we say whoever you are and wherever you may be on your journey of faith, you are loved by God and you're welcomed here. All are welcome. We say all means all and we mean that. While we're worshiping virtually, all means all. When we come back to worship in the sanctuary together, all means all. It means all of us are God's creatures. All of us are God's people. All of us are part of that community. So welcome. I invite you uh, to pause this service if you don't have some water with you. Get some. Yeah, it's just regular water. We'll have a blessing of it. And it'll give you a chance to remember your baptismal vows. So I'm so glad to cheer and invite you to join us for worship. God, the stories of creation say that you moved over the face of the waters, over the face of chaos, and you created. We give you thanks for that reminder of water, of its cleansing property, of its healing properties, of the importance of water in our lives. And we remember baptism when we are cleansed when we are made one with you. So as we gather together in worship, as we gather to remember who and whose we are, as we remember vows, and as we covenant to be your people gathered together, surround us, fill us, empower us in this time of worship. We pray it in the name of your Son, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever. Amen. Today's scripture is baffling. We often refer to it as Jesus' baptism, yet Jesus' baptism is almost an afterthought. Much of the passage deals with John's ministry and his response to, what then should we do? As you hear these words, I invite you to reflect on what questions you have about living your faith in today's world. Reading today is from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 22. In the 15th year, the rule of the emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea and Herod was ruler over Galilee, <clears throat> his brother Philip was ruler over Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was ruler over Abilene during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. God's word came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. John went throughout the region of the Jordan River, calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts 
and their lives, and they wanted God to forgive their sins. This is just as it was written in the scroll of the words of Isaiah the prophet. A voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be leveled. The crooked will be made straight, the rough places made smooth. All humanity will see God's salvation. Then John said to the crowds who came to be baptized by him, you children of snakes, who warned you to escape from the angry judgment that is coming soon? Produce fruit that shows you have changed your hearts and lives. Don't even think about saying to yourselves, Abraham is our father. I tell you that God is able to raise up Abraham's children from these stones. The ax is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and tossed into the fire. The crowds asked him, what then should we do? He answered, whoever has two shirts must share with the one who has none, and whoever has food must do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. They said to him, teacher, what should we do? He replied, collect no more than you are authorized to collect. Soldiers asked, what about us? What should we do? He answered, don't cheat or harass anyone and be satisfied with your pay. The people were filled with expectation and everyone wondered whether John might be the Christ. John replied to them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than me is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The shovel he uses to shift the wheat <clears throat> from the husks is in his hands. He will clean out his threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn, but he will burn the husk with a fire that can't be put out. With many other words, John appealed to them, proclaiming good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler, had been criticized harshly by John because of Heroditus, Herod's brother's wife, and because of all the evil he had done. He added this to the list of his evil deeds. He locked John up in prison. When everyone was being baptized, Jesus also was baptized. While he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit came down on him in bodily form like a dove. And there was a voice from heaven, you are my son whom I dearly love. In you, I find happiness. Some of you may know that, that I enjoy fishing. And as part of a ritual each year uh, at the beginning of fishing season, I watch a river runs through it. 
It's one of my favorite movies, and I, I marvel at the uh, fly casting, at the precision of that. Now, if you've seen the movie or if you've read the book, you know that the author's father was a Presbyterian minister, but who taught fly fishing with a metronome and that it was something extraordinary to get into that movement of the fly line. But the, the author uses a phrase in, in his book, I am haunted by the water. That Madison River that he fished, that he would, he knew intimately from the time of a young child through his whole life, haunted by the waters. And I think that's something that we can bring up as we talk about what it means to be baptized, to remember our baptism. The scriptures today are of the, the baptism of Jesus according to uh, the Gospel of Mark, or excuse me, the Gospel of Luke. Now, it is interesting to me that the baptism of Jesus in Luke's account is kind of a secondary thought. The first people are gathered around, the people are gathered around John the Baptist as he explains to them what this washing is. Now, the Hebrew people, the, the Jewish people were knew of, of washing. There would be different pools that they would wash in. But John the Baptist was calling them to a baptism of repentance, of washing away the old, of creating new. And they were asking John, who was one of those people, quite honestly, that I would not want to get too close to. He was kind of a nut. And he was a prophet in the true Old Testament sense of prophet. He was one who said, this is what God is saying and would live it out. He dressed in the simplest of clothing. He had a strange diet. He was from a, uh, was thought to be from a community that were known for their self-denial practices, their asceticism. And he was not beyond calling people out, looking at the, the Pharisees and calling them a brood of vipers, you, uh, pointing out to them that they were just trying to, to play the game. He looks, the, the people look at John, who has just called out the Pharisees and said, if they don't have a chance, what chance do we have? John, tell us what we're supposed to do. Be honest. Don't take any more than you are entitled to. Be kind in order to live out your faith. Dallas Willard reminds us that growth in faith is a growth in, in spirituality is moving from a faith in Jesus to, live, to believing, from believing in a faith in Jesus, a belief in Jesus, to living out the presence of Jesus in the world. That second part, that living out the presence of Jesus in the world is the deepening of spirituality, the deepening of faith, where it goes from what we're supposed to do in order to get ourselves into heaven to celebrating the life that Christ calls us to live here. You see, baptism is a reminder that we're part of a community, that no matter where we go, we have a home, that the church makes vows. As we pick up a child, I remember holding mine as we were doing baptism, and, and I was clear when it was time to baptize my child. I was standing up, Kim and I were standing up as mother and father. It was not that, that I was the pastor. We had friends of ours who came in to preside at our baptism. Because we were saying, we will raise this child, in, these children, in ways of faith. And we were hearing the promise of the community that together we would raise 
one another's children, grandchildren, that we would be supportive of one another, that we would make sure that faith was not just something that was pulled out in special occasions on, a, on Sundays when we showed up on Christmas, on Easter, but that we would talk about the importance of faith every moment of the day, every part of life. You see, that's what John is talking about to these people who were looking for, for, for hope. And after, we t after John is brought up and we hear the, the beginnings of the, discussion, of the struggle between John and Herod, as an afterthought, Jesus comes down and is baptized. And it's, it's really unclear whether or not John the Baptist actually did the baptizing or what. But according to the language that is in the Gospel of Luke, this was an intensely private experience. The voice that is heard coming down is directed only at Jesus, and he may have been the only one to hear it. And the dove that came down, yeah, again, to Jesus. He receives his call within a community, within a community that is asking what it means to be the people of God. As we are asking in our time, what does it mean to be the people of God? What does it mean for us to have a place in this world? You know, one of the things that we're talking about with COVID-19 is essential workers. It, who is essential? Those who are will go to the front of the line. And we have to ask, you know, where does the church fit? I remember being in seminary back in, in Denver, you know, and if just east of Denver, out on the plains of Colorado, there were all kinds of, of, uh, of tornadoes that happened. And there is a story of a small community in that area in, in eastern Colorado where a tornado came through and the, the story goes, apocryphal or true, I'm not real sure, but that as the tornado went into town, it was hit and miss, as they often are, about what was destroyed. And they said the only building that was destroyed was the Methodist Church. And then shortly thereafter, nothing of any value was lost. I sometimes wonder if that's not the epitaph of the church, epitaph of the church, that we have lost our way by trying to privatize faith, by trying to make it an issue uh, between me and Jesus that if I'm baptized, if I believe, if I say the right words, that's all that's important. We believe in Jesus. And the call is now, has always been, and is now, how do we live the faith of Jesus? I want to remind you of the uh, vows that are part of the United Methodist Church. As we join the church, as we profess our faith, as we bring our children up for baptism, and I don't want to get into a discussion uh, of, of whether or not you should have believer baptism or infant baptism is, is the right way to go. I happen to believe that, it, that baptism, infant baptism is a powerful sacrament, a reminder, a promise, all kinds of stuff. If you're a believer baptism person, that's fine. There are things that are worth fighting about. I don't think this is one. Each case reminds us that we reaffirm what was said on our behalf or what we have said at other times in life. The questions are, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? We see a world that seems hell-bent on destruction. 
where brother is against brother and sister is against sister and parent and child are separated and we argue and we fight and we're willing to bring out arms in armed protests throughout the United States to try to get our side across. And we point at them and say, well, they've done it too. Wickedness, evil. Believing that hate can drive out hate. Believing that power will change the world. Do you renounce the ways of wickedness, of evil? And do you repent? Are you willing to say, God, forgive me. My brother, my sister, forgive me. For I have been more interested in destroying than building up. That's a, a, an amazing vow. And it's followed with this one. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? We are here not simply to say, I believe in Jesus. And as long as Jesus and I have our hearts together, as long as I have done the things I need to do, as long as I am sure my name is written in the Lamb's book of life, then what happens in the world is not important. Yeah, it's, it's not new. If you talk, if you go back and look in the early church, there were the Gnostics, there were a group that believed that what was important was knowledge, gnosis. And what I did with my body, what was going on with that, was irrelevant. It was either to be, uh, to be beaten and to be uh, held in check, or it was to let the body do whatever it wants, because what was important was my inner presence, my mind, my knowledge, my my understanding, because that could be part with God. And so what happens in the world is irrelevant. What happens to anything else is irrelevant. Let's just talk about what's going on. Don't let the church get tied up in politics. Don't let the church talk about real issues that are going on in the world today because that's not the purview of the church. The church is only designed with our, to get, keep our relationship with God going, and yet it is this baptismal vow. Do you, do you accept the freedom and power God gives you, gives us, gives the church to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. That we can no longer close our eyes to the needs of our sisters and brothers who are oppressed because of the color of their skin, because of their sexual orientation, because of choices that they are made. We cannot sit back and say, come into this church and be loved and be welcomed, and then when we go out into the world to not do all we can to create a community of peace and grace, of justice and love where we recognize our part in systems that oppress, where we recognize our part in systems that belittle and deny, where we make it all about our comfort rather than being the people God calls us to be. Will we be known as a community that not simply says, you are welcome, but actively lives that welcome out so that no matter where we go, we are known. We are known as people of justice, of peace, of working to create community. And that has some real specific issues that are part of us. How will we be known? Are we willing to tackle the difficult issues that are around us? Are we willing to witness to the love of God and that every person 
as a child of God? Are you willing to be free to walk against what seems to be the majority of you? Are you willing to love the unlovable, to dine with those who often eat alone? Are you willing to go up to those who are outcast and welcome them and sit with them and eat with them? and embrace them. Do we accept the freedom and power God gives us? Do we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and promise to serve him in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Can we really say this church, this community, is open, welcoming, and affirming that we will stand up and encourage and embrace and welcome all people. We will not ask them to come in and hide who they are in order to fit in, but will celebrate the amazing diversity that God has called into creation and the amazing diversity that strengthens and empowers us to hear the words and of hurt and of, to acknowledge the pain and heartache and loss of people who have been judged because they don't fit in. You see, baptism, as much as we would like to make it or would be willing to see it, is simply a rite of passage. You, you, you're born and you're baptized and then you go on. You know, there's one of the jokes about, uh, about a church, church that had uh, trouble with squirrels. And they kept trying to decide what to do with the squirrels. And one time they... they captured the squirrels and they took them off, but they came back. Finally, someone said, you know, the best thing to do, I know exactly what you can do to get rid of your squirrels. You bring them into the church and you baptize them. And then the only time you'll see them is on Christmas and Easter. Now that's a joke, but that's part of, a, of a, an understanding that when the church becomes so tied into those rites of passage, that have little or no meaning other than it's something you're supposed to do. This action, this baptism, this remembering of our baptism, this confirmation, this renewal, reminds us that what was done once is remembered, is remembered, put back together in a new way to say, how will we be God's people? Resisting evil, injustice, and oppression and living a community of faith and openness and welcome and grace and justice where we will talk about and figure out ways to live our differences knowing that underlying it all, we are children of God. And meeting hate with hate is never going to work. And meeting division with division only divides us further. And agreeing to do the hard work that is necessary to build a community of faith and to let that community go out into the world. Do you accept the freedom and power? Do you believe in the, the renewing power of Christ to call us into a new way of being, to challenge us to repent? Are we willing to celebrate the Christ for, who has opened the church? who has opened us to welcome all people, to not set barriers in front, 
but to set a whole new way of openness and grace and to be willing to live as faithful members, to be willing to lovingly hold one another accountable, to be willing to work together in difficult issues, in joyous issues, in painful times, to celebrate that God is continuing to work and bring about new creation. So, as we come to this baptismal time, this renewal of baptism. Now, if we were doing this with the church full, we'd have several places for you to gather. And you'd take, the water would be, would be blessed. We would take that, put it on foreheads, on your forehead with the words, remember your baptism and be thankful. So I encourage you, if you don't have a small bowl of water to stop this, this uh, video and to go get some because in a few minutes we're going to have a time of remembering and you can bring people you bring your family together and remember this and tell the stories of baptism but let's remember our baptism and be thankful thanks be to God amen focus this time on remembering our baptismal vows, on 
blessing this gift of water that God has given us, remembering our world. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks this day for the gift of water, the water that nourishes our land, the water that flows through the rivers into the ocean and continues a cycle of evaporation and precipitation that gives life. And we're thankful, God, for this time of renewing our baptism where we remember these, this water, the water that you moved over in the, to create, water that is a source of life, the water that fills us, that hydrates us, that cleanses us, that calls us into community so that we pray one for another. It calls us into community so that we challenge one another in love, so that we sit across a table of persons we know and love, but think differently than they do, knowing that even so we are one family. So we ask God that you would bless us and that you would bless this water. A reminder of life, a reminder of renewal, a reminder of grace. Bless us as we renew the vows that we made or that were made in our names. Renew the vows that are from confirmation, from joining the church. And all of this we pray in the name of your Son, our Lord, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Let's try that one again. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, as a reminder, when you join the church, you may have come up to the front. You, there are any number of ways that we do this. You may have been immersed in baptism. You may have had water poured onto your head. It may have been sprinkled. There are any number of ways, but I want you to remember the vows that you made and give you a chance to reaffirm them virtually together. So on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? And do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's people in the world? I invite you to take some water, to place, to get your fingers wet. And if you're with others, to make the sign of the cross on the forehead of another. Or if you're by yourself, to take, to take that water, place it on your forehead, and say these words. Remember, I remember my baptism, and I'm thankful. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we gather, as we're gathered here virtually, 
This is a time when we remember those vows that we have talked about and our willingness to put our time, talents, and treasures to the work of God in Christ through First United Methodist Church of Roseburg. Your time, talents, and treasures, your, your tithe, your giving. It is because of you that we are able to do the ministries to which God calls us, of which you are a part. Ministries large and small, we th I thank you for your support and ask you to continue that support. Now, again, if you have a church home, a place that is your, your home church, your community, then by all means, give to that church. If you do not have a church home, we hope that you'll consider us your church home and that you'll join with us in the ministries of Christ in feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, reaching out to the least and the lost, and covenanting together to be a community of Christ, disciples for transforming the world. So I invite you to give. You can give to, to the church by sending us a check, putting it in an envelope and mailing it to First United Methodist Church, Roseburg, 1771 West Harvard Avenue, Roseburg, Oregon, 97471. Or you can drop a check off in our mail slot or if the church is open to, to bring it in and hand it to one of us. You can go to the website fumcroseburg.org, follow the giving prompts there. Or you can go to the Give Plus app. Again, log on and follow the prompts to give but I ask you to give generously to the work of Christ that is going on in your name. Thanks be to God.
Thank you for being part of our worship service. And now as we come to the end of this service, I invite you to live your baptismal vows out in the world. Be people of resistance. Resist hatred with love. Resist anger with grace and peace. Be an advocate for those who have no voice. Join in creating a new world. St. Francis of Assisi said, share the gospel wherever you go, and if you absolutely have to, use words. Let your life and your presence be the light of Christ. Let your words come as affirmations to the way you live, and go in the grace and peace and love of God our Creator, Christ our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah, just a reminder that uh, we will be having the... Uh, virtual coffee hour. We do that at one o'clock. The Friday email that uh, goes out has the Zoom link. If you don't get that, if you haven't gotten that, I invite you to email me at dtomp2420 gmail.com at gmail.com um, and we'll make sure that you have that before our time. But thanks for coming and being a part of this worship service.